by now you would have listened to part one of chapter one which is on synchronizing an IT strategy and now we are going to go over part two of this lecture the evolution of corporate IT has gone through four cycles of four epochs uh, and each one has a different thrust the first one um, start off in the 1970s which was the data processing epoch and the focus was on um, efficiency improvements and it was particularly for large organizations which could afford uh, expensive mainframe computers. The next epoch uh, was the productivity or PC epoch where starting from the 1980s the personal computers got cheaper and so organizations of all sizes could afford improvements in productivity. Uh, and up to the 2000, before internet really took off, uh, we worked in a, in, a, in a zone of information scarcity. Uh, and after 2000, we are really in an area of information abundance. The internet, starting in the 1990s, once uh, it was uh, open to everybody, um, started this era of collaboration um, among organizations, uh, gave affordable global connectivity, which gave us email, e-commerce, social media, and the global supply chain. And the current cycle started about 2010. Uh, we call it the cyborg epoch. It's the advent of ubiquitous connected personal smart devices. And the term cyborg refers to the blurring boundary between man and machine. The machines become tools for amplifying human ability. For example, think about Wikipedia. We have moved from an era where we had to know stuff to an era where we are we need to know how to search for uh, knowledge so your smartphone your computer becomes a constant part and so it becomes a part of your brain uh, wi-fi enabled pacemakers smart watches strapped on your wrists fingerprint readers augmented re reality glasses and chip implants make you increasingly indistinguishable from the internet. Organizations such as Amazon and Zappo warehouses, um, we have thousands of robots working alongside humans, allowing one human to do a job that once required 20 people. Uh, I saw a, a video clip of a BMW factory in Germany where they have three maintenance workers and the factory work, uh, that's it. That's the total number of employees in the factory and all production is done through robots. There are three IT-centric drivers which are fracturing the landscape for existing in industries, and we call them the trifecta. The first one is digitization, and digitization results in zero reproduction and transportation costs. And uh, this is a great example, uh, and the example I use often is uh, reading books um, in the past, and I love reading. Uh, and you can, you know, on a Sunday, I can start reading in the morning, and it'll be, you know, 10 o'clock at night, uh, and I'll be continuing to read. But in the past, I had a limitation, so, you know, if I had three books to read, I would finish reading that. And then I had to get up and physically go to a shop and buy the next set of books or go to a library and get the next set of books. Uh, even if I ordered books on Amazon through the internet, I had to wait for the books even with same day shipping or next day shipping, not same day. Next day, I had to wait for the books to come. This was in the 1990s. And then in 2008 or 9, I discovered Kindle. And now I don't have to wait. Uh, there is Kindle where I can just press a button and get my next book. Or there are softwares for libraries where you can press the button and borrow the next book. So digitization erases geography, creates a new division of labor from humans and machines, 
and this is an important aspect which is really fracturing the industry. The next part driver is infusion of software into different products which never had software before and this is moving companies from offering products to offering services. You don't sell a box anymore, you sell a service. And finally, the availability of connectivity throughout. I don't know if those of you who are old enough to remember, Sprint used to offer email services to companies in the late 70s and early 80s, and they used to charge companies per email, so many dollars per email. And now, the, the cost of communication is almost zero dollars. Um, voice over IP is reducing the cost of telecommunication. So this is, is an important trifecta which is, which is making huge differences uh, in the industry. So we are going to start looking at digitization and the three cubes of dig dimensions uh, on the digitization cube. So the three dimensions are the actual offering, books into digital offering, physical books which become digital offerings, CDs which now become MP3 files. That's the first part. The second part is how it is purchased, and the third dimension is how it is delivered. So we looked at offerings, and I talked about books, music, software, movies, services, lets them reach a broader market than previously possible and it also changes how and where they are produced the example we look at is physical um, check caching using smartphone cameras uh, so now you can um, basically cash in your check uh, take a picture and then deposit it rather than going to an ATM or a bank the second component is the purchase process, uh, which is now digitized. Um, so for example, you can pick up an in-store item purchased online that removes geographic constraints on where a market offering is bought. Um, Starbucks uh, has enabled purchasing of customized drinks using a smartphone before a customer arrives at a physical store, and that accounted for a uh, four billion dollars of its annual sales and finally we look at how it's delivered um, video streaming erases geographic constraints on where a marketing offer offering can be delivered the advent of 3d printing could foreseeably make this even possible deliver physical goods digitally now this shift also works in reverse uh, so take Redbox for example uh, tapped into a latent need in the market by switching to physical delivery of movie rentals that had been largely di uh, digitized. Now think about Redbox versus Blockbuster and kind of see where Blockbuster failed, Redbox has actually succeeded. So digitization has raised the entire industry's bar for operational efficiency. Um, old news, we had books, movies, music, and now we're looking at manufacturing, services, finance, medicine, insurance, advertising, and education. Um, education, of course, we are looking at online classes. You can register online. So think about the three different dimensions. One is the actual offering. Second is how it is purchased, and third is how it is delivered. So the question you have to ask is, are advances in technology making digitization possible in your industry? In which facet? Uh, and this is something for you to think about as you are looking at your company and your industry. Um, you notice that things like Western Union's telegram service, Polaroid's cameras, Sony's CD players, Timex watches have all become irrelevant because of digitization. So this is something for uh, all of you to look at 
and think about uh, your own industry and how digitization uh, can affect your industry. The second aspect which we're going to look at is infusion, which is basically baking software or putting software into products and services. And it could be in how they're produced or delivered. Um, it could be in watches, locks, toilets, thermostats, sneakers. And we are looking at the internet of devi um, the internet of devices. That's that's what we are looking at right now. And the internet of devices is actually accelerating this trend. Internet of things or devices. Uh, we are looking at devices talking to each other. Uh, and the business challenge is what to do with them. Now, the consequences are that non-IT industries are getting into software businesses and products are morphing into services. So for example, Rolls-Royce now sells propulsion hours, not engines, jet engines. And so we're looking at revenue streams, not sales. And the way you lock in or build barriers to entry is through data. Um, and the service business has a greater long-term revenue potential than just selling a box. Services create ongoing revenue streams. Their values drives pricing, unlike products that are priced by adding a markup to costs, and they can lock in customers. So let's, let's look at examples of lock-in. Cars can ex offer services like live traffic monitoring, congestion-driven navigation, rerouting, and wear-based maintenance scheduling. Barina generates as much revenue from selling digital sewing patterns as it does selling its embroidery machines. Kraft's internet-connected Tassimo coffee machines report flavors of coffee being consumed and Coke's fountain drink dispensers track what beverages customers are mixing. Uh, Netflix and Amazon exemplify how firms can use IT to create non-coercive lock-ins. So for example, Netflix uh, had a, I think a million dollar award on building recommendation uh, patterns using uh, machine learning and that software uh, which they are used, the winner got a million dollars for it, and that's what's used to recommend other uh, 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 titles for you to view based on your likes and dislikes. And that's created a lock-in for customers because that's kind of unique to Netflix. So here are some examples. So here is an example of how many lines of software code. The space shuttle had 0.4 million lines of software code, whereas a typical car has more than 100 million lines of software code. A typical new car right now has more software code than Windows or Facebook or the Mac OS. Infusion of software is unconstrained by economics because the sensors will be tiny and cheap to be embedded into any everything um, it'll be unconstrained by technology because internet protocol has 100 addresses for every atom and so the question for non-IT managers is how can we infuse software into our products and what end so this is something non-IT managers have to talk about and and discuss and here is an example of Amazon's um, button uh, dash button uh, which adds the Internet of Think capability to existing appliances the last dimension of um, the trifecta is ubiquity and that's essentially cheap fast connectivity everywhere and anywhere um, example, last year's average speed transfers the Bible twice a second. Uh, it has freed up TV spectrum and it's accelerating it. Broadband is now a constitutional right in Finland. More and more places, countries are looking at internet connectivity as an infrastructure 
like electricity or roads, um, and uh, which basically means that everybody should have access to it. Not having access to internet has become a huge disadvantage for huge sections of population. So let's look at this table and we look at when Intel was founded, 1971. And if things had progressed like IT today, then this is what should have happened. A Ferrari in 1971 could go about 174 miles per hour. And if it grew like IT, that's about 68.4 million miles per hour. Let's look at it from a, the back end. An iPad's processing power essentially costs about $300. Not the iPad itself, but just the processing power of iPad. Today costs about $300. And in 1971, the same processing power, if you wanted that processing power, that was about $100 million. So this kind of shows how technology has improved and changed. The confluence of all three, digitization, software infusion, and ubiquity has really made a lot of new possibilities, radically new business models, totally new classes of competitors, and uh, new people coming in. It's not the industry experts, but it's completely new people coming in and changing the game. The firm is completely reimagined, and people are learning to race with the machine, blending machine and humans to increase productivity and not against it. Uh, there are multiple examples. Uh, corporate examples include the book industry, which is completely changed by Amazon, the music and film industry, which has been completely upended in the early 2000s with iTunes and Apple Music. But I, I just want to give you an example from uh, uh, my personal life. Uh, in the 1960s, early 1960s, my uncle came to the United States as an engineer uh, to work in the United States. And um, at that time, early in his career, he was too poor to call his parents in India, my grandparents in India, and my grandparents um, also did not have the money to do call collect. So they established a system uh, where he could tell his parents, you know, he's alive and doing well every month he would send a blank telegram, uh, which is where the receiver would pay for the telegram. And when my grandparents were told that there was a telegram from this person, they would decline to accept it. And this way he was able to signal to his parents that he was alive once a month. And compare that, that's in 1962-63. Compare that to 2003, 2.1 when I came here, um, I was able to call my parents regularly and within a few years I was able to video conference uh, with Skype uh, which essentially is a great example of how digitization, software infusion and ubiquity kind of the confluence of it. Phone has now has a lot more software in the connectivity is there it's cheap and fast and the whole thing has become so from analog to digital communication has allowed me to video conference pretty easily.